this is the quietest class ever. I need to bring out like a caffeine pump in here and just sort of spray it at you. Yeah, okay, applause for that one, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> just sort of spray you folks down with a light mist of coffee every time you walk in the door. Or tea, for those of you who have some degree of civilized taste, that's fine. I'm into Downton Abbey right now, so yeah, I it's, it's an addiction, what am I gonna do? Um, and I feel like it's been gamified, right? Like it just, like it hits every pleasure center possible down and Abby, all these new shows and stuff like that. They they really they really work these to basically hit everything that anyone would ever want to put on a Pinterest board. Okay. So we get to talk today about ORMs and programmatic DB interaction. What is an ORM? Ideas, thoughts? Frantic clacking of keyboards as you Google the there we go, object relational mapping, excellent. I love the fact that everybody instantly turned to Google. That is, I've got you trained, finally, it only took like six weeks, ask Google first, awesome. Okay, so object relational mapping. Object relational mapping is a, is a simple way to interact with a database, is a good way to put it. When we talk about programming languages, and you remember that, that we had a long conversation about Java, C++, Python, and the nature of, of how programming languages interface with the computer to, to do the instructions that you maybe don't want to write out in ones and zeros, right? So you can think of object relational mapping as the computer's way of having a programming, this is, this is going to be a little bit of a weird analogy, the, the computer's way of translating for data the same thing that it does for processes. So when a, when a computer is doing something, a program, it's, it's executing a process. It's, it's trying to do something. It's adding numbers. It's completing a task of some, of some kind. But really when you're programming, what you're trying to do usually is you're trying to have a process work for you. And instead of writing it down in ones and zeros or what we call assembly language, we have some kind of interface programming language like C++, like Java. They all do different stuff. When you think about databases, and the big bucket of stuff, the bucket of toys with the strings attached to it, uh, going directly into that bucket and figuring out what's what and writing long queries is a really good equivalent to writing assembly language. Assembly language is the next step up from binary, basically. It's, and I'm, I'm simplifying again, but it's a good way to think about it. So what that basically means is that writing SQL directly is often a really inefficient way to get data in and out of those buckets. What we want to do is have an easy way for the computer to be able to interpret a little bit better the kind of information that we want. So rather than doing a, a, a SQL query that says something like, um, I would like to know all of the records that exist with ID number 44873 through 73492 that all were executed between 11 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon on these three dates in 1974, um, it's often very complex to write that out in SQL. And so what we do instead is we treat pieces of information like an object. And we are able to, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a little bit on what objects are here in a second, and we treat pieces of information as an abstract concept that gets filled out later with the reality. We draw in an outline and say, computer, fill in the outline with stuff, like a pancake mold. I'm going to have a lot of food analogies in this conversation because I am freaking starving. I did go to Pie Bar, as some of you recommended the other day, and that steak and potato pie was a life changer. They do the pastry really good there. Now I'm starving and I'm going to go back there again. I hope they have chicken pot pie today. All right, enough with food. The concept is that you're filling out an outline and saying, find me all of this stuff in this tiny bucket that is a representation of the information that I want. When I talk about an object-oriented programming language, do any of you have any feeling for what that might be? Any concept of what objects are? Basic idea? Okay, you can think of them as a map. What is the key characteristic of a map? What's that? Legend or key, that's a, that's a good way to put it. And the legend or key would be a way to interpret that map, right? Like how big is it, what stuff, right? That is, that is, that is a key characteristic of a map indeed. Another key characteristic of a map, and in fact its fundamental nature, is that it is not the thing it is representing, right? A picture of the U.S. with a, a distance marker on it is not the U.S. 
it is an abstraction away from the U.S. that helps us to wrap our mind around what the U.S. looks like, right? The pictures, a little Florida, you know, a little pointy bit sticking out into the ocean, and you get an idea of what the U.S. looks like from looking at a representation of it. Would it be reasonable or feasible to try to get an idea of what the U.S. is when you're little, maybe three or four years old, and, and you can't walk around the U.S. to see what it's like? It's not particularly feasible, is it? it? It makes a lot more sense to say, hey, we live in a big place. Here's the outline of what that place looks like, right? And here's California, and here's the weird bits over here, and a big old chunk up here that, you know, very few people live in, but it's extraordinarily large. That's, that's what the U.S. looks like. So often when we think about an object, what we're thinking about is a representation and a simplification away from the bigger thing that it could be. There's a lot of theory around object-oriented programming languages, but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a very simple representation of a larger concept. Now, you brought up a great point, William, which was that there is a legend there often and a key that says this map is at one one-thousandth scale. For something like the US, it might be something like one one-hundred-thousandth scale. I can't do math with ratios right now in my head, but if the U.S. is 3,000 miles across from coast to coast and you had a representation that was one three thousandth of the size of the U.S., how big would your map be? One mile. Exactly. Right. If you, if you take the entire map and, and it's 3,000 miles across and you do the map in one three thousandth of that size, it's one mile across, right? Yeah, so that is how you can look at it and go, okay, so there's an abstraction, but what if we wanted to make it even easier to look at? And we said, let's make it a uh, one three hundred thousandth representation. So that would mean that your map would be how big across? Not one mile, but one one hundredth of a mile, right? So now we're starting to get down to something a little bit more reasonable, okay? And a one one hundredth of a mile would be like, what, 52 feet across? Now we're starting to talk about something a little bit more useful, pretty detailed in terms of the representation, and you can still use it, right? A 52-foot across map is something you could envision, right? We could plaster up across the roof, the, the wall of this, this um, classroom right here. Yes? Does that make sense? So what we're talking about when we talk about objects is the capacity to, to size and resize our abstraction away from the concept of what we're actually talking about. If we're talking about a person in a database, we don't necessarily want to slurp up every single thing we know about that person every single time we're talking about them. Instead, we might just want a couple of characteristics about them that abstracts away from all of the very detailed information we have and just tells us one or two very key things in a broad concept. Like what if I have a huge database full of really interesting information like say Facebook's databases, MasterDBs, and all of the associated databases. Maybe I don't want to pull all of the information about everybody up every single time I'm doing something. Maybe all I want to do is pull up only the users that exist between the ages of 24 and 27 in the Seattle metro area that I think I can sell a ticket to Tractor Tavern at, right, for the, the show this Friday. So when we talk about that, we, we would sit there and think to ourselves, how do I take the concept of the object, of the map, of all of the information I have, and draw an outline around it, and then say, go get me only this stuff. The way that object relational mapping works is it says, I'm going to simplify it to the greatest degree possible and then make it available for you to write about it in the programming language that you want to write about it in. It's a step back instead of that binary and then assembly language and then computer programming. Instead of bucket O data, uh, SQL, raw SQL, and some way to interface with it, it says what is the easy way to interpret and get back what's probably exactly what you want from that giant, giant bucket of information. So when you go and Google object-oriented programming or object relational mapping, does the concept of a map resonate with you? Does it make sense that that would be something that would help you to represent a small piece or, or the shape of the larger piece of information you're looking at. Does that, res okay, I'm seeing mostly nodding heads. And I'm gonna do the thing again where I expect hands to go up. Who doesn't understand a single thing about what I'm talking about right now? And it's okay to say that. 
I'm not always good, good, wonderful. Thank you for raising hands. When I talk about a map as a, as a representation of that information, what about that doesn't, doesn't ring with you? Can I, can I answer a different question about it? Is there a different analogy that I could use? Or maybe you could tell me where, what, what sentence I'm saying that, that what, sometimes I stop people and I go, okay, 90% of this conversation I understood, you just skip past my math ability. So stop right there and, and keep going on describing a bit. W where's the point at which I lost some of the folks in here on what a map to what bigger stuff is? Objects, what okay. are you mentioning? Because that's a very, you know, that's a common word when you think about what it means. Oh, okay. Thank you. That is a that is a really good question. Is is that what's kind of causing the problem here? That object has so many different meanings in English that I need to get a little more specific about what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Um, then I will try to do that. In fact, I'll even define it in terms of English. How many of you have ever diagrammed a sentence before? You know, subject, verb, object. Okay, so a lot of you have diagrammed sentences, or you understand the concept that there is a doer, the thing they're doing, and the stuff that they did, or the person they did it to in the sentence, right? Does that make sense? And although um, the subject and the verb and the object are different in basically any English language sentence, the concept of the subject and the verb and the object has to be there in the sentence, whether explicitly or implicitly, to make it a good English sentence, right? You have to understand that a thing happened, somebody did that thing, and what that thing, and, and how that thing happened, right? Does this make sense? I, I want to see nodding heads so that I understand what's going on. Okay, good. So at the end of that sentence, we say there's a thing that, that stuff was done to, and that was the object of the sentence. When I say, he walked the dog, what is the subject of that sentence? He, good. What is the verb, the action in that sentence? Walked. What is the object in that sentence? The dog, good, okay. She programmed the computer. Subject? Action? Object? Okay, in those two sentences, what are the two things that had stuff done to them? The dog and the computer. That grammar, that word, object, is the exact same way that we think about object-oriented programming or uh, object relational mapping. We're talking about a concept that has stuff done to it that acts as a representation of a, of, of a thought. Does that help to def define a little bit what we're talking about? It's, it's such a simple concept that it's hard to describe well. So I'm trying to make it as, as simple as I can here. The dog and the computer are the stuff we're doing stuff to. The object, when we talk about object-oriented program, is the stuff we're doing stuff to. When I implement an object, when I, when I create an object in a, in a programming language or in a database, what I'm doing is I am, I am acting on a thing, and I'm, I'm saying this is the variable, this is the x that I'm going to be working with. All right? It's the abstract concept that in that moment fills out with whatever that thing is in real life. He walked the dog. She programmed the computer. They ate burritos. OK? So in that moment, all those things are objects. But until I say the sentence, they ate burritos, we don't know what that object is, just that there will be one and stuff will get done to it. See what I said about the food analogies? We're going to keep going on that whole burritos thing in a little bit here. All right. Does that help? Go, go William. Oh, I have a question. So yes. it's kind of like the front end side of it, if you're searching a hashtag, mm -hmm. and you're basically, if you're searching like food porn, then mm -hmm. Instagram or burrito. Food um, porn on Instagram? Oh, that's a killer search. I've done that. That's good. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, oh, so God, that's hamburgers. Yeah. That's the finished product. You're searching mm -hmm. your own technique. Yes. What we do. Okay. Yes, you have instantiated the object. You have said, this is the thing that, that stuff is going to get done to or that I want to know about. Okay, and then that search, that's a great example of hashtag food porn, is a great example of exactly that concept. That's the thing we're doing stuff to. He searched for food porn. If you could put it in that sentence, you're probably talking about an object, if it sits at the end of the sentence. All right? Does that help at least a little bit? Deanna, okay. And, and does that help for all of you folks that were trying to figure out what that object means? We talk about objects and objectifying and object oriented, and, and it's. It's a word that's coming close to meaning the same thing as thing or stuff at this point. And yet, those words can have very specific um, meanings in, in context. So in this context, an object is the stuff stuff's going to get done to. It's a thing. It's stuff. And until you say, he searched for food porn, or they ate burritos, that object does not have form. You give it form by programming it. 
So in that same thought, in that same way, we say, I'm not sure yet what data I want to go for. Wait, I've got an idea, and I'm going to phrase it this way, and I'm going to write it in Python or C Sharp or Java. It's a way to get information easier out of databases by not having to skip over to SQL to write it there, okay? Or whatever other language you're using to access the database. I'm often just kind of conflating accessing a database with writing SQL, which is not accurate, but it'll, it, it helps for the moment to just think of it that way, okay? Like right now when I'm talking, I may say, so when you talk to your friends, I'm not necessarily explicitly specifying it, but I'm assuming that most of the people in the room are going to be speaking in English, right? That's not necessarily accurate, but it's, it's an assumption that's a handy one for me to make quickly, a heuristic, right? What's a heuristic? Anybody have any ideas? Quick shortcut to getting something done. A heuristic is a shortcut. It's a mental shortcut that you've made in advance, and you've made that assumption. When you see someone who is getting out of a truck near a river and they're in waders and they're holding a fishing pole, what do you think they're probably going to be doing? They're probably going to be fishing. Is it possible that they've shown up in that gear to film a commercial about fishing? Yes, it's possible. But it's probably more likely that they're there just to fish, right? Yes. Yes, this is, this is the rule of the most simple thing you're talking about is Occam's razor. Yeah, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. Okay, so what, what we're doing with object relational mapping is we're saying we're going to implement the simplest possible questions and make it easy for you to make those assumptions because the computer can probably tell what you want past a certain point. So does, this is a very complex concept and, and it's hard for me to get it across well and simply, which I actually really love as a teacher being able to do and, and develop out these metaphors that help to describe something that's super complex or inflected or situational or contextual into something that is simple and universal. But it's a good idea to think of the fact that an object is nebulous until you say what it is, a dog, a computer, a burrito, and then it has form. You are the one giving it form. You're saying this is the thing we're going to do. Does that make sense? Good. What other questions do you have? Any ideas? Thoughts? Object relational mapping is how we basically talk to databases now. You're not probably going to be writing SQL. You're probably going to be writing in Python or C++ or <coughs> PHP or whatever and implementing some library that has pre-existing heuristics mapped in for data. It's probably not likely that in a database full of a lot of users and login information and stuff like that, that you're going to be going and looking for stuff like whether or not they like hearts or candy for Valentine's Day. It's an irrelevant question, right? No, no one really thinks about that unless you have that built into your database. You are going to be thinking about what kind of information they need to use your site. You're building those heuristics in, those shortcuts in the way that you think so that you get a great trade-off on computational time and the amount of effort that you put in to managing how you get into your database and store stuff there. It's a lot easier to say, Python add the user to the database, then Python make a call to SQL and then write a whole long list of sprocks that's stored procedures that does the whole long list of stuff that SQL requires to store that information in the database. Take the shortcut. It's easier. It's faster. It's more maintainable. Simpler is always better. So any other thoughts, questions about what is ORM and why this is, this is a way we abstract away from it? You'll all be accessing databases sooner or later. and. I think if you understand what's happening underneath, you'll be able to, to phrase those questions in English a lot easier. Is this database going to store my username and password? Well, you can answer that question in English, and it's a lot easier to answer that question in Python than it is in SQL. Okay? Last thoughts and questions? Killer. All right. <laughs>